Welcome to the Top 100, PC Gamer's annual rundown of the 100 very best games you can play on PC right now. This year has seen a few new faces join the PCG team, which has meant a lot of changes to the list. New entries include the likes of Legends of Runeterra, Doom Eternal, Titanfall 2, Superhot VR, and even What the Golf. In this video, we'll be showcasing some of the choice games from the list and what makes them a must play in 2020. For the full top 100, visit PCGamer.com. Without further ado, here are the showcases. Devil May Cry 5 has managed to stand firm for another year in the PC Gamer Top 100, from the 46 spot down to 67. But don't be alarmed, it's not because we're any less in love with this hack and slash favourite. Shredding, blasting and crunching wave after wave of the underworld's nastiest hellspawn never gets old. It's a true classic. While firmly rooted in its hack and slash history, Devil May Cry 5 is a decisively fun addition to the series roster. Fast, fluid and beautifully animated, a choice of three characters offers new opportunities to nail down precise combos and a varying blend of otherworldly and overly excessive combat. And when you finally mash the buttons just right, you're rewarded with an increasingly edgy soundtrack and a gory crescendo of blood, orbs and rock organ. It's a winning formula we only wish there was more of in PC gaming. But nonetheless, we're content with our lot in Devil May Cry 5 for another year. It offers something for hardcore fans and fresh demon hunters alike. So whether you're up to date with Dante's sprawling timeline and tumultuous family history or not, you'll find some fun in our pick for 67. Number 52 on our top 100 list is the tranquil farming game Stardew Valley. This slice of life sim lets you lead the life of a hardworking farmer, planting, nurturing and harvesting crops to grow a thriving farm that you can happily live off. Being plonked in a giant empty lot with just a handful of seeds and some hand-me-down tools might seem a little daunting, but once you settle into a routine, the seasons will just fly by. Stardew is a flexible farming game that lets you build any type of farm you like. You can create a small cosy barn with a cute flower garden or a giant vegetable empire. I'm definitely part of the latter group and love all the planning and preparation that goes into growing the ultimate bumper crop. If you want a break from the busy schedules of farming life, you can wander around Pelican Town meeting its friendly residents. Getting to know the community is a big part of the game and there's always more to discover in town. Stardew Valley is a blessing and a curse. It's a peaceful life sim like no other, but it'll make your heart ache for the tranquility only found in the countryside. At number 35 with a roar, we have Monster Hunter World, a game that absolutely sank its teeth into me last year. There are two things that make Monster Hunter such an amazing action game. One of them is the monsters themselves, which are lusciously animated in how they attack and react to your hits. Each one is like a multi-stage boss fight in a great Japanese game. Parts break off of them as you wear them down, they have tells you need to learn to avoid their attacks, and each monster has a bunch of specific body parts you need to target depending on your role, which is so satisfying to learn. The same goes for the other thing that makes Monster Hunter an amazing action game. It's weapons. There are so many of them, and they each play completely differently. I've played like 150 hours of this game, and I've only used like half of them. I love bouncing around in the air with the insect glaive, but oh my god does it feel badass to nail a monster right in the face with a greatsword overhand swing, hitting it so hard that it falls over. Monster Hunter World's Iceborne expansion is really an essential addition. In addition to the new campaign, it adds a bunch of new monsters to the old zones and a big new area where pretty much anything can spawn, letting you hunt for a specific target or just going out and seeing what you run into. The best thing about it though is it has a brand new gathering hub which puts every resource you need, like the blacksmith who crafts all your new gear, right in one super convenient space. This is the same pedigree that Capcom brings to its action games like Devil May Cry, but with even more meat on its bones. For you to like hack off and then turn into a hat. Sliding into the 34th spot, it's Super Mega Baseball 3. There's not a lot of on-field baseball sims to choose from on PC, which is why it's so important that the Super Mega Baseball series keeps on getting better. 
The managerial aspects of the SMB series have always been a bit weak, but the outstanding new franchise mode in Super Mega Baseball 3 lets you tinker with your roster over multiple seasons, wrestle with the salary cap, and presents you with far more situational decisions during individual games. Combined with several new on-field systems, Super Mega Baseball 3 has added lots of depth and careful decision making, both on and off the field, while still preserving the cartoony action of the earlier games. Online play, which arrived with Super Mega Baseball 2, returns again with the excellent pennant race mode. It can also play one-off games or custom tournaments against your friends. And once again, everything in Super Mega Baseball 3 is customizable. League structure, length of games and season, right down to your player's uniforms and the team logo. Super Mega Baseball 3 is the series at its best. It's fun, it's colorful, and it's casual enough to recommend to people who don't usually play baseball games. But with franchise mode, the depth is there if you're really looking for it. Battle Time, number 29. There's something just inherently awesome about having a bunch of 50-ton murder mechs firing lasers and missiles at one another that just never gets old. At its core, Battletech is a turn-based strategy game where you control a team of mercenary mech pilots as you move from planetary conflict to planetary conflict, picking up missions and sweet salvage. What Battletech does well is that it introduces a meta game about running a small business. Aside from involving yourself in space politics, you also need to do everything possible to keep from going bankrupt. Usually what this means is you end up taking jobs you don't want in order to afford repairs and more importantly, pay everyone's salary. Turns out the only thing more deadly than long range missiles is crippling debt. Total War Three Kingdoms has held its ground at 22 this year. Time along with some good expansions has only convinced me more that this is Creative Assembly's best Total War and just a phenomenal grand strategy game. It's chock full of all the stuff we already know Total War does well, it looks amazing, the factions are diverse, the map is incredible, but it also fixes a bunch of stuff that's held the series back even during its highest points. Because Romance of the Three Kingdoms and the era of Chinese history it mythologizes was so rich in larger than life characters, Creative Assembly has made those warlords the focus. They define their factions from the eclectic roster of troops to unique mechanics, all of which makes a massive difference when it comes to playing them. You can be a bandit queen beset by enemies and forced to make difficult alliances, or a master manipulator who tricks other factions into fighting. We accept. These characters all have relationships, rivals, best friends, all of which affect their performance when they're working together. The best team of generals on paper might actually be at a disadvantage because they all hate each other's guts. Even diplomacy between factions is more personal, with grudges and rivalries getting in the way of diplomatic proposals. There's so much more drama, and that extends to the battles themselves. It was already impressive right out the gate, but since launch Creative Assembly has only added more to make it stand out from the rest of the series. The expansions have introduced new campaigns that slot neatly into the regular campaign, fleshing out the timeline with more events and factions without making it feel bloated. Each contains some experiments and twists, and of course lots of new units, but even without all these additions, Three Kingdoms is still one of the best strategy games around. At number 20 we have Half-Life Alex. It only took 15 years, but in 2020 we finally got a sequel to Half-Life 2. Well, a prequel. Alex is once again set in the dystopian City 17, and features everything you'd expect from a Half-Life game including head crab zombies, physics puzzles, and a compelling mystery-laden plot. Seeing City 17 realised with modern visuals and from a more intimate perspective only hammers home what a unique, atmospheric setting it is. The game squeezes an incredible amount of variety into its 15 hours, from large scale firefights with combined soldiers and moments of quiet atmospheric exploration, to genuinely unsettling horror in the dark tunnels beneath the city. If you thought a poison head crab leaping at you in Half-Life 2 was bad, imagine that happening in VR in a dark room where all you have is a tiny flashlight to find your way to safety. And don't forget the gravity gloves, which let you flick distant objects into your hands, an interaction that feels amazing even after you've done it a thousand times. Half-Life Alex isn't just another great Half-Life game, but arguably the best VR game ever made. 
and even though it's a prequel, it opens up some thrilling possibilities for the future of the series. Titanfall 2 comes in at 10th in our top 100 list, and that's not only because it's one of the finest shooters on PC, it boasts a Moorish, cathartic multiplayer mode, and the best campaign in a shooter, bar none. And knowing that, until recently, has been bittersweet. Since BT and Co first plummeted down to the earth in 2016, it struggled for players and sales along the likes of Battlefield 1 and Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, until it hit Steam this year. It's given Titanfall 2 an overdue second chance, a new lease of life, which means that I should probably just stop banging on about it all the time to everyone, like I'm doing now. There are more modes than in the first game, and dynamically designed maps that fit heart in mouth wall running with spacious mech arenas. Plus, the short time to kill really fits the game's flow beautifully. As you can probably tell, I love Titanfall 2, and I think you will as well. At number 3 is Rockstar's sad cowboy epic, Red Dead Redemption 2. Despite being a lavish, expensive, blockbuster game by one of the biggest developers in the world, Red Dead 2 is very unusual for a so-called AAA game. It's a downbeat, melancholy story about an outlaw gang clinging to a fading way of life. It's stylish, intelligent and understated, the complete opposite of Grand Theft Auto in many respects. It's clear Rockstar made the game it wanted to make, rather than something with mass appeal, and yet it still sold a billion trillion copies. Industrialization is creeping across the West, slowly transforming the wild frontier and making the lives of people like our anti-hero Arthur Morgan increasingly difficult. There's plenty of cowboy fun to be had here, robbing banks, chasing trains, gunslinging, bar fights and every other Wild West fantasy. But it's in the quiet, slower moments where Red Dead Redemption 2 really shines. Riding across that vast, rugged landscape on horseback. Exploring at your own pace, hunting, fishing, picking herbs and flowers, meeting people, getting tangled up in their dramas and seeing this moment in history from different perspectives. Making camps, watching the stars, surviving. Red Dead 2's world has a fidelity and realism that no other open world game can match, a testament to both Rockstar's bottomless pockets and its peerless attention to detail. And the variety is remarkable. This world packs in a huge amount of terrain from snowy mountains and boggy swamps to grassy plains and bubbling hot springs. And when you hit Saint Denis, the rapid growth of the United States and its impact on the land is clear. This is a dense, intricate city with crowded streets and chimneys spewing smoke into the air. It's everything Arthur Morgan and his ragtag gang stand against, and the biggest clue that their days of living off the land, free from the tyranny of government, are sadly numbered. Red Dead Redemption 2 may well be Rockstar's finest game to date. It's an unforgettable experience with a story and characters I haven't really stopped thinking about since I first saw this impossibly lengthy credits roll. And now, we take a moment to honour the games which are no longer with us in the top 100. Gone, but not forgotten. At number one is the magnificent Disco Elysium. As someone who loves crime fiction, one of the most exciting things about Disco Elysium is getting to create my own detective. 
Through the things you see and do, you can shape your character's personality, traits and skills to a terrifyingly deep degree. But they don't even have to be a good detective. You can give your character the superhuman insight of Sherlock, but also be a self-destructive mess like The Wire's Jimmy McNulty. And that's just one of dozens of interesting combinations. It's a role-playing game in the truest sense, and one entirely led by story and dialogue. It's bold for an RPG to sideline combat almost completely, but this game pulls it off with confidence. And there's such a dizzying variety of skills, stats and conversation options that you could play it five times and still not see everything it has to offer. If you value depth, freedom, customization, and storytelling, Disco Elysium is one of the finest RPGs on PC. Ah, Disco Elysium. Now that was a singular gaming experience. I rolled a custom character, dialing into the mental side of the stats, aiming to embody the very cerebral eccentric detective I would love to be. I fully immersed myself in the gorgeously rendered world, absorbed every syllable of the wonderful script, and then died of a heart attack two hours in, jumping down from a low ledge. I've surely had the full Disco Elysium experience now, and need no more. Hello, I'm Kim Kitsuragi, Lieutenant, Prison 57. You must be from the 41st. Disco Elysium is one of the most charming games I've ever played. While you're often bumbling your way through your investigation, or muddying the waters with some off-kilter comment that rarely makes any sense whatsoever, Disco Elysium's sorry superstar disco cop protagonist is one of gaming's finest. Whether you want to tear up the streets of Revachol, Revachol? Revachol? As a hard-ass loyalist, or saunter through as a pumped-up drug addict with a killer tie and half-baked political ideals, you are free to do so. But be warned, the game has a way of bringing karma back around in many unsuspecting ways. It's a game in which you build relationships with those fantastically imagined characters around you just as much as you take control of the conscious thoughts of your own. That is to say, you may not be entirely compass mentors throughout. Disco Elysium is both a fanciful RPG and a hard-hitting political intrigue detective game all rolled into one, and you won't waste a second playing it. Disco Elysium accepts my detective persona for who I am, a fumbling excuse for a cop who throws up at dead bodies and cries when suspects poke fun at him. The fact that I can create a character that's a total mess and have the game fit around my terrible decision making is what makes Disco Elysium brilliant. I dumped all the skill points I could into my detective's empathy and conceptualization abilities, meaning he didn't know what the heck a crime scene was, but give him a piece of artwork and a whole world would open up. And believe it or not, that was very helpful during my investigation. Everyone I've ever chatted to about Disco Elysium have all had wildly different experiences, and that's a sign of an exceptional RPG. My detective may be a complete disaster, but he's got heart. Never fear, super sensitive art cop is here. I love how much this game loves words. You can just feel the enthusiasm vibrating behind every line of description and dialogue in a way that I honestly haven't experienced in another RPG. And Disco gives words such prominence on the screen. The interface design is so smart in how it presents all of that text, but manages to keep it from becoming exhausting. That presentation is almost a character in itself, and that's a big part of what makes Disco Elysium the best RPG on PC right now. We don't have an award for the best use of punctuation and text, but if we did, it would win that too. Disco Elysium! Wonderful! A new entry that cuts straight to the number one spot is no small thing. I'll get around to playing that at some point. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there's probably enough time to finish pretty much every single one of the top 100 before this time next year. I'm just going to have a few more rounds of Spelunky first. But you can head to PCGamer.com for the full list, of which every single one comes with our highest recommendation. This has been Graham for PC Gamer, thanks for watching.